Thanks for listening to the sermon podcast from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planning churches. You're about to hear a message that was preached live from one of our recent church services. We hope that you'll open your heart to hear the Holy Spirit speaking directly through this message. Stay tuned after the message for information on how to get connected with us. Thanks again, and enjoy today's message. Amen. I want to uh, share a message with you this evening that... uh that was inspired um, by a, a commercial that played during the Super Bowl. And uh, you probably, you might, uh, might already know which commercial I'm talking about. But uh, for those who uh, didn't watch it or didn't care to watch it, I want to, so that you will understand my message this evening, first I'm going to show you the ad, then I'm going to explain it a little bit more deeply, and then I'm going to show you why I think that it was missing the mark. So uh, I'm going to try to do a little screen share here to the screens. And uh, everybody needs to pray that this works. All right. There we go. Do we have it? There it is. Okay. So with, no, with the only context I'm going to give you is that you're watching the football, the Super Bowl game, and amongst all of the goofy ads that they show, this thing pops on the screen. Are you ready? Okay, so this time what I just want to do is tell you what you're looking at because it goes by so quickly, right? So first thing that you're going to see here is an image. So this is basically what we have a collection of images of people washing other people's feet. First one looks like a family in a home, and it looks like a very traditional uh, mother and father, and it looks like maybe a, a guy... Uh, coming home from college or something, washing the feet of his dad. The next one we have is a police officer, and we are in some kind of alleyway here, and we have a young man who looks like he's in trouble, and there's flashing lights of a police car in the background, policeman washing his feet. Then you have, this is kind of like a, like a high school uh, hallway where you have kind of a, a preppy girl kind of uh, washing the feet of someone who is uh, non-traditionally dressed. She's got short hair and dyed purple or something like that. And the, the, the trendy girl, the popular girl, maybe washing the unpopular girl's feet. Then you have an uh, elderly gentleman in a leather vest wearing cowboy boots washing the feet of a Native American man out in the desert somewhere. Okay, now this one is uh, what began to stir up some controversy here. We are at the scene of what it says, a family planning clinic. Think Planned Parenthood. Think Abortion Center. And on the right side, you have a group of protesters, people holding signs. Uh, Then you have one woman that looks like she came from that group uh, who has come over to wash the feet of a young lady who looks like she's in trouble. And uh, maybe she came out of that family planning clinic, but she is getting her feet washed by this lady. So then we have a very troubling scene here. We have on the right side uh, a woman who looks like she's bound in alcohol addiction, and then you have a younger lady, maybe a daughter, who knows, but uh, she is washing the feet of an alcohol addict. The next one we have, this is, <laughs> this is in the scene of an oil field. And apparently we have uh, a guy who has been working in the oil rigs. He's got a big, heavy jacket on, and he's, uh, he's washing the feet of a young lady. And over on the side, there is a sign which shows uh, clean air now. So the oil rig worker cleaning the feet of a, a global clean air advocate. Okay, these, these continue. That's a lot to see in one little ad here. Then we have a bus, uh, and in front of the bus, it looks like a migrant woman, maybe a, a mother who has gotten off the bus holding a little baby in her arms. And then you have a middle-aged Karen-looking woman <laughs> uh, kneeling down and washing the feet of this uh, woman who's come off the bus. Then we have, we have a typical suburban scene in front of somebody's house. And you have a typical couple uh, washing the feet of a what looks to be a Muslim couple. 
Uh, she's wearing a hijab, and so her feet are being washed by this typical suburban couple. And then you have this kind of crazy scene here where this is, looks like a, uh, some kind of a rally where you have two groups shouting at each other, uh, but two of the people from those groups have decided to sit down on the steps and wash each other's feet. The last one here is kind of interesting. <laughs> we, it looks like we're at Cracker Barrel now. And uh, you have, uh, in, a, in a kind of a, a country scene, you have an elderly a white man and an elderly black man who <laughs> have their feet together in an old wash tub. And, uh, and the, the black gentleman has reached his hand out across and is, ha- is resting it on the white man's arm. Then, with all of that, here is the, here's the, the moneymaker. You have here a Catholic priest who's got a cross around his neck, and he's kneeling down to wash the feet of what appears to be uh, maybe a transgender. We don't know for sure, but somebody who has very nice legs but dressed like a man. And in front of an ocean scene, the, the priest has his Evian water bottle out washing the feet of this person who has chosen to represent himself that way. And uh, you can see over on the side, he had just taken off his roller skates so that he could get his feet washed by the priest. And with all of that in mind, Jesus didn't teach hate. He washed feet. And the message is, he gets us, all of us. This is supposed to be a message to introduce people to Jesus. So, okay, interesting. And uh, I, I want to take this opportunity. I'm going to read a scripture from the book of Jude. Jude, verses 20 through 23. And as we have that in mind tonight, I want to explain to you why I believe that when I saw that and the more I thought about it, the more disturbed I was and why I believe it was misguided. And not only was it misguided, I believe the spirit behind it dangerous to the church of Jesus Christ because it confuses the real message of the gospel. And I want to share that with you tonight from the book of Jude beginning with verse 20. I'm reading from New Living Translation. It says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others. By snatching them. Say snatching. Snatching them from the flames. Say flames. Of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution. Hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Let's pray tonight. Lord, I'm coming tonight by the precious blood of Jesus. We approach this subject, God, the message of your gospel. God, we approach it with care. Lord, we're praying tonight that you would focus the thoughts of our hearts, God, the intents of our lives, the message that the church is supposed to preach to this world, God. May it be clear tonight. And God, I'm asking for your grace. I don't want to just get things off of my chest tonight. Lord, I don't want to get involved in my emotions, but I want to expose, Lord, the, the, the wickedness of the perversion of your gospel and that we could that we could preach it with clarity tonight. And we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. God's people would say, amen. I want to begin with, what did this ad get wrong? What's wrong about it? So watching the Super Bowl, when you see that, I just want you to reflect for a second. If if you saw it in the moment, what what was the initial reaction of your mind and your heart? I don't know about you, but to me, the first thing I felt was, confusion. What did I just see? And I think if that was my reaction, it was most likely the reaction of a lot. And if, you know, if I've given my life to try to understand the word of God and the message of Jesus, and I looked at that and I felt confused, what about the person who has no idea about the Bible? What about the person who's never cracked it open or never been to church or never encountered Christ? What do you think they thought about it? probably even more confused than I was. 
And what I think, I, I want to give you a few things that I think the ad got very wrong. I, I know what it's trying to teach. It's trying to teach tolerance. It's trying to teach that we need to be patient with people that we don't agree with. That we shouldn't allow hatred in our hearts. And there is truth to those things. But in the teaching of those thoughts and those ideas, there carries with it a poison pill that, that if we don't address it tonight, that's why I thought it's so important to preach this tonight so that we understand what is the real message of the gospel. Number one, this ad preaches the gospel of politeness. There is a false view of Jesus tonight. That his main message was, Jesus wants you to be a nice person. And if you are a nice person, and you put up with everything else in life, then that shows your holiness, your righteousness, your piety, your devotion to the Lord. Now look, I I don't think God wants us to be jerks all the time. But the point of our salvation, the point of the gospel is not that we would be nicer than God. And many Christians have twisted what Christianity is to believe that we're just supposed to be nice people. And that's incorrect tonight. Number two, what the ad got wrong, is that these political issues, there are definitely some political issues at stake here. And I'm not going to get into all the politics of what you saw in the video tonight, but What the ad gets wrong is that those political issues, if you're on one side or the other, that means you're a true Christian. That if you agree uh, with one side, if you agree with the the Democrats, and and notice that what the ad shows, it always shows the, the one in the position of power washing the one in the position of being the dispossessed. It never shows the opposite. And that's what gives it away. That the political issues show what the true Christian virtues are. Number three, there was a great misunderstanding of what it means to wash feet. We know Jesus washed the feet, right? That this is something that he did. But the Bible shows us, you can read it for yourself. I'm not going to take the time, but in John chapter 13... It's in the context of what? The Last Supper. Jesus is going to go to the cross. He's saying goodbye to his disciples. And in that context, the Bible says he takes off his outer garment and he appears to them as a servant and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples, his future apostles of the church. It is important to understand the context. When Jesus was out doing ministry and encountered the Samaritan woman in her sin... He didn't drop to one knee and begin washing her feet. When Jesus uh, was having his uh, arguments and when the Pharisees tried to catch him in a trap, uh, he didn't stop and say, wait a second, Pharisees, take off your shoes. I need to wash your feet. You see what I'm saying? There is context, which is important here. The the idea of this ad is that, you know, we should, as believers, we should, uh, as people who are holy and seeking righteousness, that we, should, we shouldn't argue with people. We should never be di- uh, unpolite. To, we should never disagree. We should just wash their feet, serve them where they are. And we got, it, it, that is exactly the opposite. Jesus washed the feet of who? His disciples. It was a message of servant leadership. It was not about trying to win people who are in their sin. He washed the feet of his closest followers. It was more than just an act of kindness to someone who was lost. Now, we know that Jesus, he spent time with people who were downtrodden, people who were dispossessed. He spent time with them. He ministered to them. He prayed for them, those who were sick in bondage, those who were in sin. Jesus went to their house of the tax collector, the chief tax collector even. But we don't see him washing their feet. This is a misunderstanding of this ad. What it said at the end there is that Jesus did not teach hate. This is another thing that the ad gets wrong. Jesus did teach hate. 
He didn't teach hatred of people, but he did teach the hatred of sin. And that's what's revealed in our scripture here tonight. The Bible says in Jude, it says, rescue, verse 23, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. If we are going to rescue people, we have to acknowledge that they're in sin. That we were once in sin. And that we were saved, we were, we, were, uh, we were rescued by Jesus. It says, show mercy to others with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Didn't Jesus also teach? He said, hate your mother and your brothers. And we know that that's in context to our, to our love for him. But to say that Jesus did not teach hate, it's a misconception. It's a, it's a deviation from the true gospel. Jesus did teach us to hate sin. Anything that would drive people away from the message of life and hope, any, any, gospel, uh, uh, any gospel understanding which would twist, and that's why I think I've been having such a strong reaction to this thing. Because at the core of it, it is bringing greater confusion. And I believe the Holy Spirit is not pleased with that. It's so important that we are clear about the message that Jesus has for us. The whole campaign ad, maybe you've seen some of these ads before, it comes from a group that's called He Gets Us. He Gets Us. And you can go visit the website. In fact, I did just to check it out, so I wanted to make sure that I'm representing them properly. He Gets Us. This is what they say on their website about what they're trying to accomplish. We hope to remind everyone that Jesus' teachings are a warm embrace, not a cold shoulder. And he didn't let pro-this or anti-that opinions prohibit him from seeing the value in all people. He gets us, invites you to explore Jesus' story on your own terms and at your own pace. Our message isn't from a particular church, nor is it affiliated with any denomination. We compromise. We comprise a humble, uh, many humble perspectives from a diverse group of Jesus fans and followers, with a variety of faith journeys, and lived experiences bound by a common desire to rediscover and share the compelling story of Jesus' life in a new way. So I took some time to go through every page of their website, and I made sure that what I'm about to say is going to be accurate. Their entire website from top to bottom. I even went through all of, the, all of their different stories and ads that they put up there. Would you be surprised to know there is not one scripture on their entire website? Not one. Isn't that interesting? Can I tell you tonight that the word of God does not need a facelift? And I think well-intentioned people who are trying to be nicer than God are trying to give the gospel a facelift, trying to make it a little bit more pleasing and acceptable to people, put a little candy coating on it so that it's easier to swallow. Can I tell you, man, the gospel is not easy to swallow. The gospel is, if a man does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. I'm not anticipating them producing that for an ad next Super Bowl. You see what I'm saying? How come the Bible doesn't teach what they're trying to say? We don't find that message in the Bible because the Bible is clear. He does get us. Yes, we know that God understands us. We know that Jesus comes to us as we are. That is true. But it's a half-truth. It's an incomplete truth. It's missing truth. You know, there's a reason why if you ever testify In a court of law, what do they, they make you swear an oath. And that oath is, I promise I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There's a reason why that whole truth is important, because you can tell truth, but leave a few things out, and therefore either water down or compromise what you've said. And I believe that this ad is guilty of doing that. Can you imagine the opportunity that these people had? They said that this Super Bowl was the most watched event in all of human history on TV. That's a pretty big opportunity. That there are more eyeballs watching that at that moment, that ad, than than at any other event on television. 
I looked it up. 60 seconds. You know how much it costs for them to put this ad on? That's a low estimate. They said it was $7 million for 30 seconds. This was a 60-second ad. So we're talking about $14 million that they had put together, and that's just to get the, the thing on, on the screen. That's not talking about all of the production and the actors and the writing and the, and the, the bureaucracy behind it. That's a lot of money. And that's a lot of eyeballs. If, if you had that opportunity to spend 60 seconds to give a message to the greatest, the widest audience that television has ever known, what would you say? Would you say that? <laughs> that's why I feel this is such a missed opportunity. What, what did they accomplish other than stirring up some controversy? Well, I believe... As I mentioned, it confused people about the real gospel. It misrepresented the word of God. It abused biblical and traditional values. And worst of all, I think, this ad served to comfort people in their sins. That's the real problem here. Is that what the word of God does? Does it comfort people in their sins? And to put a finer point on it, Uh, Anybody here read the Babylon Bee, my favorite humorous website? They they do a lot of satire with a Christian perspective, and so this was their headline that came out after the Super Bowl. Sinners relieved to learn Jesus gets them and doesn't have to repent or change their lives in any way. I think that's the takeaway. Thanks to the prominently placed Super Bowl ad, thousands of people on their way to hell breathed a sigh of relief upon learning that Jesus gets them. And they don't have to repent. It's such a relief, said local hellbound sinner, sinner, Tina Norris. This is all fake news, by the way. But it's very, very powerful. She said, I had started to feel like maybe my life was on the wrong track. And I should think about changing my ways. But then I saw that commercial during the Super Bowl. And I thought, you know what? I can be completely at ease while I'm on my way to eternal judgment. He gets me. Those guys are onto something right there. What you just saw in that 60-second ad, it's a lot of things, but it is not the gospel. It is not the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, from our scripture tonight, I want to give you a quick review of what the gospel is and why it is good news. And this is where we go to our scripture in the book of Jude. What is the real gospel? What is the hope that we can offer to the world? Beginning in verse 20. But you, dear friends, now remember, context is king. We have to understand who he's speaking to. He is speaking to the church. First of all, his audience is people who are already saved. Are we together on that? Okay, to those who are faithful, dear friends, build each other up in the most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. So to the believer, the message that God has for us is build yourself up in the faith. That means be edified, be strengthened. Be equipped to do the work that God has called. How many, how many sermons have you heard in that message? You need to be stronger so that you can do what God wants you to do. That's like half of my sermons right there. You know why? Because that's like half of the Bible, right? Build yourself up in the faith. Second thing, verse 21. Await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, keep yourself safe in God's love. The Christian life is defined by looking forward with anticipation to the soon coming return of the king. That we are living lives of urgency. That he could come at any moment and we have to live lives preparing ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. That will light a fire in you, wouldn't it? If you're looking to the sky, awaiting the mercy of our Lord Jesus. The third thing mentioned here, verse 22. You must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. And now we've got a different audience. Okay, to those who are strong in the faith, keep building yourself up. To those who are weak in the faith, what do we do for them? We comfort them, right? We comfort, show mercy 
to them. And to the backslider, to the broken, those who are wandering and lost, this is like Jesus who goes after the one lost sheep, leaving the 99 behind. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. He can rescue and redeem those who are wavering in their faith. And then, this is a different audience, ready? Verse 23. So we've spoken about those who are in the faith, strong in the faith, those who are weak or wavering in their faith, and now a third group, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Who is that talking about? Well, that is the mass majority of people who are not already in the church. Others. The others who do not know the grace of our Savior yet. Those who are uh, uh, in currently the flames of God's judgment. And the instruction we get from Jude here is to rescue them. This is why the church exists on planet Earth. We are here in 2024. We are on a rescue mission. Have you seen our church flyers lately? It's a picture of a hand reaching down into a raging sea, pulling somebody out. That comes from this kind of a scripture. This is our job. This is what the gospel does, is it rescues people who are in danger of God's judgment. That's how you got saved. You got saved because somebody prayed for you, somebody reached out to you, somebody witnessed to you, and they rescued you. Thank God, by His Spirit. The Spirit of God convicted you of sin. Somebody reached out and helped you, grabbed your hand and said, come follow me. We're going to get out of this place together. Rescue them from the flames of judgment. And then it says, with caution. Why? Because sin can contaminate. It says, show mercy to others, but do so with great caution. Be careful about what you're doing here. Be careful about this job of rescue. Hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Jude gives us an insight here. He says this work of rescuing and redeeming the lost is a dangerous job. It's like a firefighter, right? I mean, the job of a a firefighter, if, if there's a burning house, his job is to run into the house while everybody else is running out. That's dangerous. You're putting yourself at risk. Why? Because for the chance that you might be able to pull somebody out of that fire, but you put yourself at risk. There is a real danger. Living this life of evangelism, discipleship, and church planting, living in in the world, but not being of the world, that this is a dangerous place to be. That's why he encouraged us earlier to be strengthened in our faith, because we can't do this without facing some real dangers. What is the danger? The danger is that we could get caught up in that same sin. This is why we don't recommend missionary dating. Oh, pastor, I need a wife. (sighs) You know what I'm going to... There ain't no girls that's saved already. Let me go out to the world and go find one of those. And you know what? I'm going to bring her in and she's going to get radically saved. How many men have lost their destiny? How many ladies that went out to the world hoping that the dude would eventually get saved. Mm. That hurts my soul thinking about those people. With caution, because sin can contaminate. We are living in a world where the, the, the advantage is on the side of the sinner. That's the gravity that we have to resist at all times. That's why the apostle uh, Jude, he's saying, listen, you got to be careful. Listen to the message translation. Go easy on those who hesitate in their faith. Go after those who take the wrong way, but be tender and not soft on sin. Yes, we love the sinner the way God does. Jesus Christ died for sinners. He gave his life for sinners, but why? Why did he have to give his life? Because of sin. You can love the sinner and hate the sin. Listen, listen to what 1 John says. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we heard from Jesus and we now declare to you. God is light. There is no darkness in him. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness. 
who we are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know what's absent from that ad completely? The blood of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus, the fact that Jesus rescues and redeems and changes people. How many here got a testimony of what Jesus did in your life? All of that completely absent. So, the gospel that we have is a pretty good one. (laughs) It's the greatest story that's ever been told. And I think that when we try to give it a new twist, a new spin, a new presentation, a way that people have to enjoy and uh, uh, th- th- they'll surely, they'll understand this, right? And end up making it worse in the process. And I think behind the scenes, man, the devil is so happy. Behind the scenes, he's saying, oh, those Christians, I got them. Here they were trying to do something good, but all they got out there was confusion. You think the devil's happy about that? Probably he is. There was a pastor, an assistant pastor named Jamie Bambrick. I'm going to do another screen share, Jaylee. I'm going to try. And he saw the same ad that we all just watched. And uh, when he saw it, he did more than just complain about it like I did. Thank God. He saw that ad and he said, you know, there's a better way to present the gospel. He, he put together, he, it said he, he took him about an hour to put it together, and he posted it on, uh, on Twitter, and it completely has gone viral in the last 48 hours. I'm going to do my best to find it right now in Jesus' name. And I posted it on our, on our uh, Facebook page, so some of you might have already seen it. But here we go. Here we go. Got it. All right. Now share it. If we wanted to use the 60 seconds of Super Bowl time, we would have been much better off to show something like this. Got it? Okay. Help, Jesus. Whoa. Can you all read that? Don't ask me what you know. God praise tonight. Now that's the gospel. The gospel is Jesus transforms us. He saves us. He rescues us. He changes us. He breaks the chains. You don't have to be bound in this world. That's good news. Don't you wish with 60 seconds, the greatest audience the world has ever seen. that They showed something like that. Here's the good news. We don't need a 60-second ad to share the good news. That's what you are called to do. That's what I'm called to do. And if people here would have an, an, an understanding, a revelation of what this gospel is, and we would live it out in our lives, we don't need a Super Bowl ad. We can change the world. And in fact, we are changing the world. We listened uh, today is Wayman Wednesday on our podcast, and I listened to Pastor Wayman Mitchell. And he preached a message from the year 2014. That was 10 years ago. And when he preached that message, 24, he mentioned in passing, he said, and our 2,100 churches in our fellowship are preaching the good news. Do you know how many churches are in our fellowship today? It's over 3,600. I did the math. That means in, t- in less than 10 years, our fellowship has grown 71%. 
That's insane. You know what that is? That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is winning souls, making disciples, planting churches. That is people doing what God has called them to do. We don't need a Super Bowl ad if we will do what God has called us to do. So that's my challenge for you tonight. Let's not just complain about some misguided Christians who have more money than wisdom. Let's do what God has called us to do. And let's be faithful tonight. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Our scripture in Jude was very clear. The word of God is very clear. Over and over again, the gospel is made known to a broken and a lost world. To those who are struggling, show mercy. To those who are faithful, build each other up. And to those who are lost, rescue, rescue them. Snatch them from the flames. Tonight, whatever group you find yourself in, the good news is the gospel has an answer for you. Jesus is not just the nice guy who came to teach a few nice things. He's the Savior. He is the the one true God. He is the only way to God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. It's not a slick advertising campaign. It is a call of repentance and faith. But to those who will, miracles await. Transformation is available. New birth, new life. Born again into a new life with Christ. And I wonder tonight, there are people here, no doubt, who have been seduced by a false gospel. Oh, God just wants me to be a nicer person so that I can vote the right way. Jesus didn't save us just to vote one way or another. He saved us to be his hands and his feet in a broken world. And I want to challenge you tonight. Maybe you're here, you're not right with God, you're living in sin. Oh, but the gospel is for you. There is good news for your soul. You would, if you would turn from sin and trust in Jesus, in all of his word, not just a selected and misguided, mistranslated view. But if you would receive Jesus tonight in your heart and believe the gospel, you can be transformed. If that's you tonight, I want to pray with you, unsaved or backslidden in your heart. Sin has corrupted us all. We have all fallen short of God's glory. There is no one right, not even one. Oh, but Jesus, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for the ungodly. Thank God that he cares about sinners. He hates your sin, but he loves you with an unending love, a love that was willing to die on the cross, shed his own blood so that you could be saved and freed from the power of your sins. That's the good news. Do you need that tonight? Unsaved or backslidden in your heart? Can I see your hand? Thank you, brother. Is there someone else? God's speaking to you. You lift up your hand. You need salvation. You don't need a corrupted gospel. You need the real gospel tonight. Willing to turn from sin, to trust in Jesus. Willing to swallow the hard pill of I need to change my ways. Jesus, do a miracle in my life. Is that you? Anyone else? Quickly here tonight. You lift up your hand. Pray for me, preacher. Amen. My, my man, you lifted up your hand. Are you sincere? I, I know you are. I want you to come forward. God's going to help you. I need a brother to come and pray with this man. God would touch his heart tonight. God would transform his life. Amen. Church, I want to I wanna ask you, we're going to stand together in this place. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God to help us. The church is called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We cannot be the light of the world and the salt of the earth if we have compromised our message. And I want to challenge you tonight. The gospel is a wonderful message, but it's not going to make you popular. And if you understand that and you need God's strength tonight to, to be in this world but not of this world, then that's my call tonight. I want to encourage you. I want to believe God with you to strengthen your faith. Would you stand up to your feet? Would you come forward tonight? We're going to pray together at this altar. God, would you restore the power of the gospel in my life? Listen, there are people to save. You probably know people in your family that need Jesus. You know people at your workplace that need Jesus. And the message that saves them is not, he gets you. The message that saves them is, 
he can transform you. And we've got to be willing to preach that message in these last days with so much confusion. Come on, church, let's lift up our voices in prayer tonight. Let's cry out to the living God who can set us free. Amen. Jesus said, you you can't take a lamp and cover it with a basket. This is not what we're called to do. If we are the light of the world, we can't pretend, we can't be slicker than God and nicer than God and, and put a shield around his message to protect people from it. What a mistake. If we think that we're smarter than God, that we're wiser than God, that we're going to be more, uh, we're going to present it in a new way that's going to be so powerful. All we're doing is making fools out of ourselves. God has chosen to reveal his message to the world already through his son, Jesus Christ. The word of God is enough. The word of God made flesh. We're, We're not called to interpret it for others. We're called to transmit it. We're called to be the mailman. Okay? If I, get a, if I get a piece of mail that I don't like, I don't get mad at the mailman. That's stupid. All he was there to do is to put it in the mailbox. Can I t- we are the messengers. We are the deliverer. We are the ones just giving the mail. It's not my job to reinterpret your mail. My job is to just put it in your hands, and you have to make your own decision. We're planting the seeds. We're not making them grow. But what happens, like what Jesus said, what happens when the salt loses its savor? What happens when the light is covered? Well, then nobody's getting the mail. And I want to encourage you, church, listen, living for Jesus requires boldness. It requires courage. The people who made this ad, they think that they're being courageous. They think that they're doing something special. I think that they're just causing confusion. But what takes real courage is speaking the word of God into a lost and dying generation. That takes courage, but that's what saves people. That is what brings people out of sin. That's how you got saved. Somebody was courageous enough to tell you the truth. The Holy Spirit convicted you. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't pet you on the head. Say, there, there, I get you. (laughs) The Holy Spirit convicted you and brought you to a point of salvation. How are sinners going to get saved? If all we do is stroke their ego, it's it's okay. They're there. Mamacita. (laughs) That's not going to save anybody. I hope that this is clear to you tonight. We're going to pray that God would give us that strength and courage that we need. Would you lift up your hands tonight? Say this prayer together. God in heaven, thank you for your gospel, the good news that changes me, that transforms me, that brings me into your kingdom and makes me your hands and feet. If I'm going to be the light of this world, if I'm going to be the salt of the earth, Lord, I need courage. I need strength. I need boldness. I need you to build me up in my faith to do great works for you. I'm asking you tonight, don't let me lose my savor. Don't let me lose my testimony. God, I want to be bold and courageous and stand out in this broken world. And I give you glory tonight. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, the power of the living God, so that we can see people changed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's give him praise right now. God, we need you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this message from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. If you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you out of your sins and into a new life with him, pray this prayer from your heart today. God in heaven, I know I've sinned against you. I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, and I've broken your laws. Today, I turn from my sins as I surrender to your perfect will. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son and that He died and rose again for me. I receive Him today as my Lord and Savior. May the old things of my past pass away as you make me a new creation. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me strength to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 
We want to help you live for God. Please join us in person for one of our upcoming church services. We are located in the heart of Virginia Beach at 1045 Lynn Haven Parkway, about one mile from the Lynn Haven Mall. Please check the show notes for links to our website and social media. You can also find a link to support this ministry with a generous donation. We would be so grateful. We look forward to sharing future messages here on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. In the meantime, we pray that God would strengthen you to serve Him with all your heart.